Do you think you have a good answer to the question, why does consciousness exist at all? Wow, it's a big question. I guess I don't think at this stage anybody has a definitive answer to that. I'm Paul Kennedy, and this is Ideas, about an emerging theory that may explain an ancient problem, the problem of consciousness. What is panpsychism? So the, the panpsychist proposes an alternative research program. Rather than explain consciousness in terms of non-consciousness, we try to explain complex human and animal consciousness in terms of simpler forms of consciousness. The voice asking the questions belongs to Ideas producer Nahid Mustafa. Does that mean that even the smallest particles in the universe are conscious? That would be the, the standard interpretation of, of panpsychism, yes. And the voice answering her belongs to Philip Goff. My name's Philip Goff. I teach philosophy at the University of Durham in the UK, and my main preoccupation is consciousness. Consciousness has been a preoccupation with philosophers for centuries. Is it simply a byproduct of our complex brains, or is it, as a growing number of neuroscientists and other researchers believe, a fundamental part of the physical universe, like space and time? This episode features Nahid in conversation with Philip Goff, along with excerpts from a lecture he gave at the Munich School of Philosophy in 2018. We're calling this episode Panpsychism and the Nature of Consciousness. So there's a very famous way of defining it from the philosopher Thomas Nagel. So according to Nagel, something is conscious just in case there's something that it's like to be it. So if you contrast a rabbit with a table, there's something that it's like for a rabbit to be cold or to be kicked or to have a knife stuck in it. In contrast, there's nothing that it's like, or so we ordinarily suppose, for a table to be cold or to be kicked or to have a knife stuck in it. There's nothing that it's like from the inside, as it were, to be a table. So this is just trying to clarify the idea. This is what we mean by consciousness. It's simply the property of having experience or having an inner life of some kind or other. And the problem of consciousness is quite simply, why does consciousness exist? So despite advances in your neuroscientific understanding of the brain, particularly in the last 80 years, we still have, in my view, absolutely no good explanation of why brains produce consciousness. Yeah, so contrast in, in other areas of science, we have good explanations of why water boils at 100 degrees or why methane is flammable. You know, if you look at the underlying chemistry, you get a satisfying explanation of these things. But in terms of neuroscience, you know, we, we have good understanding of how neurons work and the chemistry of neurotransmitters and um, how the brain processes information and how the brain negotiates between environmental stimulus and behavioral responses. We have good understanding of many of these things, but none of it seems to shed any light on why there is this inner subjective world of feelings and thoughts and sensations. Indeed, it seems that, on the face of it at least, all of that information processing and behavioural functioning could have gone on in the complete absence of experience. At least that's how it seems. And so we're led, led back to the question, why, why does consciousness exist at all? First, I'd like you to do the impossible and, and answer the following as briefly as you can. Then we'll get into details later. Do you think you have a good answer to the question, why does consciousness exist at all? Wow, it's a big question. Um, I guess I don't think at this stage anybody has a definitive answer to that question. I think it's still very early in, in the science of consciousness. But I, I guess I would say that we have some promising avenues of inquiry. And I, th I think for a long time it, it did look like consciousness was something of an insoluble mystery. But I think some recent developments in, in philosophy can give us hope that we might start to make progress on this problem. In my reading, 
I, I'm not sure who pointed it out, but someone pointed out that there's no good evolutionary reason for consciousness. And to be honest, that kind of left me a little bit shaken. Um, is there any good evolutionary reason or any reason at all that this is a, an avenue of inquiry that, that needs to be pursued? Well, I think so. some people have an assumption that consciousness doesn't do anything in, in the physical world. And there is a challenge to make sense of, of how consciousness does manage to impact in the physical world. But I think when people are thinking about this, they're probably implicitly adopting a kind of dualistic position in which consciousness is outside of the physical workings of the body and the brain. And, and then we do have a real issue of how on earth something immaterial could impact on the physical body and brain. And, and then it would be difficult to make sense of there being an evolutionary advantage if, if it can't actually do anything. But I think if we, if, if we can make sense of, and this is part of the challenge, if we can make sense of consciousness being in the brain where neuroscience seems to place it rather than the immaterial soul, then I don't really see any, any, any difficulty with the idea that consciousness can do something as part of the workings of the brain. I think a, a good place to start, obviously, is, is sort of right at the beginning. And you've certainly been doing a lot of thinking about consciousness and you argue for something called panpsychism. Um, mm -hmm. What is panpsychism? I, I tend to think of it as more of a research program than a, than a theory. So for, for many decades now, we've been trying to explain consciousness in terms of utterly non-conscious processes in the brain. And we've made very little progress uh, with, with that, at least on the central, the central question you began with, why does consciousness exist at all? So the, the panpsychist proposes an alternative research program. Rather than explain consciousness in terms of non-consciousness, we try to explain complex human and animal consciousness in terms of simpler forms of consciousness, simpler forms of consciousness that are then postulated to exist as basic properties of matter, perhaps basic properties of electrons or quarks, whatever the fundamental constituents of the physical universe are. So it sounds kind of wacky, but more and more philosophers in recent times and, and some neuroscientists are starting to think that consciousness is such a deep difficulty and, and this might be our best hope for making some progress. And so when you say that, is it is it then wrong for me to make that leap in asking, does that mean that even the smallest particles in the universe are conscious? That would be the, the standard interpretation of, of panpsychism, yes, that, that the, the most basic constituents of the physical world, and it's, I mean, it's not obvious they are particles. Some, some, some physicists think they're particles, some physicists think they're strings. Some physicists think they're fields. So it's up to, you know, it's up to physicists to tell us what they are. But that would be the idea that the basic constituents, let's say particles, have incredibly simple, unimaginably almost simple forms of experience. And that the incredibly complex conscious experience of the, the human or the animal brain is, is somehow constituted of the most the, the very simple experience of it, of its parts so so that's yeah that that's the basic idea it doesn't mean i mean a common misconception it doesn't mean it doesn't mean firstly that electrons are, are having sophisticated emotions or sitting there having existential angst you know uh, the, the idea is they're not worried know, he, about you know they're not yeah. worried about things they're just <laughs> Yeah, some un unimaginably, you know, so humans have very rich and complex experience, horses less so, mice less so again. And, you know, if we keep getting down to simpler and simpler forms of life, maybe at some point the light switches off. Uh, but according to the panpsychist, we just keep getting simpler and simpler, and this continues into inorganic matter. And so that's the basic idea. And um, it does. It, it also doesn't mean that all combinations of particles are conscious. This is another common misconception that, you know, rocks and socks and tables and chairs are going to be conscious. But, but the panpsychist view is that the basic constituents of matter are conscious. And certainly some combinations, such as human brains at the, at the very least and animal brains are, but it doesn't follow that all combinations of of, of, of particles are 
conscious entities in their own right. And this is at least as good an explanation as anything else out there. Well, it's. I wouldn't say it's a good explanation, but it's maybe the least bad explanation. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, consciousness is, is such a... Well, I mean, look, my starting point is we know that consciousness is real. Nothing is more evident than the realities of our feelings and experiences. So we, we have to account for it somehow. It has to fit into our scientific picture of reality somehow. Now, what panpsychism, crazy as it sounds, offers us is a way of integrating consciousness into our scientific picture of the world that I think I think avoids the deep difficulties that face more conventional options like materialism on the one hand, dualism on the other. Uh, I think panpsychism avoids many of these difficulties. So, you know, it does have these unfortunate connotations, sort of new age connotations that, you know, some people just can't see past. But I think you should judge a view on its explanatory power rather than its cultural associations. And, and I think it, 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 no one has the complete theory of consciousness, but I think panpsychism does at least look like a, a promising way forward. You use the word crazy, and I know that you don't use that as a way to to be dismissive, of course. But I, I guess from from your use of the word, I kind of gather this idea that maybe it's it's something that people have a difficult time engaging mm. with. Yeah, I mean, I think things have things have changed quite rapidly on that score. To be honest, when I mean, if you think about the the latter half of the twentieth century, it was taboo even to talk about consciousness if you were a working scientist. You know, I know people didn't get jobs or struggled to get jobs because they wanted to work on the science of consciousness. Now, I think that's changed probably since the 1990s, um, largely due to the influence of, of the philosopher David Chalmers, who introduced this phrase, the hard problem of consciousness, that somehow inspired people to really want to deal with subjective ex conscious experience as a scientific problem. So I, I'd say generally scientists and philosophers do take the problem of consciousness seriously. When I finished my PhD 10 years ago, I think I, I, I was advised by some people, don't talk about panpsychism when, you, when you're looking for jobs. <laughs> so, you know, it, it was something that was for a long time um, treated as ridiculous insofar as it was thought of at all. But actually for the you know, past five or 10 years, it, an increasing number of, of philosophers and even some neuroscientists, are, you know, are, are beginning to see that this is that this is a really serious option on, on, uh, on, on consciousness. And so, I, there is definitely a change. It's become still probably a minority position, but a, but a very respected one. I mean, the problem of consciousness is often presented as a we've got a choice between two radically opposed theories. One, physicalism, roughly the view that consciousness can be explained in terms of physical processes in the brain. Two, dualism, that consciousness is a property of the non-physical soul. And both of these problems, both of these theories have very profound difficulties. The problem with physicalism is that it's hard to see how it can account for the qualities of experience in the kind of quantitative language of physical science. The familiar problem with dualism is that it has difficulty accounting for mind-body interaction. So most dualists, even though they think the mind is separate from the brain, they want to say there's a close causal relationship. So, you know, your decision to raise your arm in the mind causes your arm to go up, or your, your thoughts cause your lips to move as you speak. And in the other direction, light and vibrations from the world impacting on the body cause vision in some sense cause visual and auditory experiences in the soul. So there's a close interaction there. Neither of these views are attractive and we just go back and forth. Fortunately, there is now another option. So recently rediscovered ideas of Bertrand Russell and Arthur Eddington, who's incidentally the first scientist to confirm general relativity, is also a, a keen philosophy enthusiast from the 1920s have led to a view that promises to avoid both the problems facing physicalism and the problems facing dualism. So this is the view that's become known as Rossellian monism. So I, I kind of think it's a tragedy of history that I think, you know, between the two great wars of the 20th century, I think these guys did for conscious, the science of consciousness, 
what Darwin did for the science of life. I mean, I think they essentially gave us the solution. But then perhaps with the Great Depression, the Second World War, the anti-philosophy zeitgeist, I think, of the post-war years, at least in Anglo-Saxon philosophy, this kind of got forgotten about. I mean, I think the starting point is you've, you've really got to absorb the epistemological starting point of Rossellian monism, which is unusual and takes a while to absorb. So the starting point is that the only thing we know about the nature of matter is that some of it, that is to say the stuff in brains, has a consciousness involving nat nature. So this is radically different to how we normally think about things. We have this idea that physical science is giving us this picture of the universe, it's telling us what the universe is like. Um, um, it's, it's, it's hard to get used to this idea. No, the only, the only thing we really know about the nature of matter is that some of it, the stuff in brains, has a consciousness involving nature. So I argue that from this starting point, who knows what's true for certain, but from this starting point, the most simple, elegant and parsimonious speculation is that the nature of matter outside of brains is continuous with the nature of matter inside of brains in also having a consciousness involving nature. Right? So you'd need a reason. We know there's this consciousness stuff in the brain. No idea about the stuff out there. You'd need a reason to think the stuff out there was different to the stuff in here. You might think, that's, that's not, where's the evidence? That's not a very powerful consideration. But I, I try to argue that actually these kind of simplicity considerations are absolutely fundamental to how we do science. Um, you know, you, you can't do science, you, just by looking at the data, in most cases, in physics at least, because there's always an infinite number of hypotheses that are consistent with the data. And you choose between them on the basis of theoretical virtues, like simplicity, elegance, parsimony. You try to find the simplest hypothesis that's consistent with the data. And that's exactly what, I, what I'm proposing here. I think the most simple hypothesis consistent with the data Panpsychism is the most simple hypothesis consistent with the starting point data of the Rossellian monist. So there's an argument for Rossellian monism, and then from that basis, we've got strong simplicity-based support for panpsychism. You're arguing based on simplicity and elegance, as you put it, for an idea that, frankly, has twisted my mind, kind of like a pretzel. But what you're saying, mm -hmm. if I get this right, is that the starting point for talking about consciousness must be what goes on inside the brain. So the starting mm -hmm. point ought to be that that inner subjective experience and not an investigation of brain function. Yeah, I think that's definitely part of it. I mean, maybe if we can just back up a little to, I think the way into this is is really to, to, to get the perspective of Russell and Eddington, their, their work in the 1920s that's, that's recently been rediscovered in academic philosophy and, you know, is, is part of the reason I think panpsychism has suddenly uh, come, on, come onto the table again. Russell and Eddington's starting point is that physical science tells you a lot less than you think about the nature of the physical universe. So I think in the public mind, there is this idea that physics is on its way to giving us a complete story of the nature of space and time and matter. But what Russell and Eddington realized is that upon reflection, it becomes apparent that physics is really confined to telling us what matter does, how it behaves. So if you think about what physics tells us about an electron, physics tells us that an electron has mass and charge. So how does physics characterize these properties? Mass is characterized in terms of gravitational attraction and resistance to acceleration. Charge is characterized in terms of attraction and repulsion, very roughly. So these all concern the behavior of the electron, what it does. Physics doesn't tell us anything about what philosophers like to call the intrinsic nature of the electron, how it is in itself. Um, so, so actually, it turns out there's this huge hole in our scientific picture of the universe. Science, physical science tells us nothing about the intrinsic nature of matter. Um, so this is sometimes called the problem of intrinsic natures. So I, th I think the genius of Russell and Eddington was to connect up the problem of intrinsic natures 
with the problem of consciousness, right? So, so we can think of the problem of consciousness as the challenge of finding a place for consciousness in our scientific theory of the universe. And then the problem of intrinsic natures is this problem that there's this huge hole in our scientific theory of the universe. So Eddington's great suggestion, building on Russell, was, well, let's put consciousness in the hole. So, so the idea is, you know, there's just matter. There's nothing spiritual, nothing supernatural. There's just physical, the physical universe. Physical science describes its behavior, what it does. But in terms of its intrinsic nature, it's constituted of forms of consciousness. So this is a beautiful, simple unified, parsimonious way of bringing consciousness into our scientific picture of the world. So, so I think it's, that that's the real starting point, I think, for realizing the attractiveness of the panpsychist solution. What I think the project is, the central project with consciousness, is to find a place for it. We know it exists. We know it's real. You know, nothing is more evident than the reality of your own feelings of pain or pleasure, for example. So we, we have to find a place for it in our scientific picture of the world. You know, if, if you have a general theory of reality that can account for all the data of observation and experiment, you know, people talk about the grand unified theory that science is aiming for. If you have a grand unified theory that can account for all the data of observation and experiment, but it can't account for consciousness, that theory cannot be true because you've missed something out. We know that consciousness is real. So this is the challenge. It's about, I guess it's about having a consistent picture of reality, one that um, is compatible with everything science tells us. And the problem with dualism is, you know, that there's a challenge there of, as to whether it is compatible with everything science tells us, but also what, one that has a place for consciousness, this thing we know is real. And that's the problem with materialism, that it that it's incredibly hard to see how you can account for consciousness in a, in a purely materialistic worldview. And, and certainly we've had very little success so far trying to do it. So it's about having having a consistent picture of the world, which which is consistent with everything science tells us, but which has a place for consciousness. And that's why this uh, Russell Eddington form of panpsychism, you know, seems kind of crazy, but it but it seems to it seems to do that job. And so, was the the Russell Eddington proposal was that something that you had been familiar with for some time, or was this something that also came to you in the course of your studies? Yeah, well, this was certainly not something I learned as an undergraduate. I mean, I, I was I was really tortured by the the problem of consciousness when I was an <laughs> undergraduate. I I thought so. I, I was taught the only two options were materialism on the one hand, that you think you know it's just a matter of the chemistry of the brain, or it's some kind of illusion. Or dualism on the other, that it's something outside of the physical body and brain. And I thought pretty early on that neither of these options w were terribly plausible. I mean, I tried to I tried to believe materialism for a while, but I think I mean I think there are, so, there are philosophical problems in materialism and more straightforward scientific problems of dualism. But you know, it, it's almost like a lot of the consciousness debate is like a fight for the least worst option. Yeah. <laughs> but um, but yeah, so so I I mean I. I actually ended up my undergraduate thinking the problem of consciousness was irresolvable. That's what I actually wrote my undergraduate dissertation on. And I thought I'd had enough and went to do something else. So, but it was only discovering this, this Russell Eddington, Eddington option. Um, firstly, through an article by, by the philosopher Thomas Nagel on panpsychism from the 70s. And, and I just realized that, that, that there was this option that sounded weird, but, you know, avoided these, these terrible problems with, with the more conventional options. I'm not sure who said it. Uh, it may have actually been David Chalmers who said, um, and I, I am assuming he said it or wrote it in, in somewhat of a tongue-in-cheek manner when he said, uh, Descartes, when he proclaimed, I think, therefore I am, that was either the most the most scientific or the most unscientific uh -huh. thing that was ever said. Uh -huh. um, and so I'm wondering, this this Russell Eddington uh, model, what would that have to say about this proclamation? Yeah, I mean, if you think it's interesting to think of it in terms of Descartes. So Descartes obviously famously thought the consciousness, the conscious mind and the physical body are completely different kinds of things. And, they, they, you know, he thought he could see just by thinking that they couldn't possibly be the same thing. So I think the Russell Eddington response would be to say, OK, Descartes, you, you were right about consciousness, right? We, we, do, we do know what consciousness is by 
being conscious. You know what pain... Some people say consciousness is a mystery, but I, I don't buy that. I think, you know, you know what consciousness... Nothing is more familiar. You know what pain is when you feel it. You know what red experiences are when you have them. So it's not consciousness that's a mystery. But what Descartes was wrong about is that he thought he understood what matter was. Uh, so the Russell Eddington thought... And, and, I th and, and I think this is in general the confusion people are making on, on, on uh, the problem of consciousness. They think they know what matter is. They think neuroscience is telling us what, what the matter of the brain is. Mm. And then we think, how on earth do you fit consciousness in there? It doesn't seem to have a place. But uh, the Russell Eddington approach is say, you don't know what the hell matter is. Hmm. Neuroscience and physics tells you what it does, tells you really useful information about what it does. You know, if you, if you can predict the behavior of matter with great accuracy, then you can manipulate the natural world and have all sorts of extraordinary technology. That's brilliant. But it doesn't tell you what matter is. And, and it's hard to absorb because we're so used to thinking that, you know, physics and chemistry are telling us what stuff is. But once you really absorb that, that, you know, we don't really know what matter is, then it, it turns the problem of consciousness on its head because it's not it's not consciousness that's the mystery. It's matter that's the mystery. Conscious. We know what consciousness is. And so we have to build up our picture of matter around that understanding of what consciousness is. You've talked about your coming to panpsychism. You've characterized it as a conversion. Uh -huh. What is why the word conversion? I think I use that reference because what, one of my earliest publications, uh, a couple of my earliest publications, and, and probably my most cited publications, are, are criticizing panpsychism, actually. <laughs> and I had a paper called uh, Why Panpsychism Doesn't Help with the Problem of Consciousness, <laughs> which, is one of, which has actually become the sort of paradigmatic attack on panpsychism. Uh, but so, so I think I talked about conversion in that sense. But um, I mean, I actually... I actually, I actually still stand by, 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 by some of those problems in, in a way because I think I was thinking of it, and a lot of people, there are problems with panpsychism, right? It's, it's not a complete theory of consciousness. Nobody has a complete theory of consciousness. All the theories have problems. But some people approach panpsychism and say, oh, well, it's got problems, it's, it, and therefore, you know, it's a load of rubbish. You know, but that to me is like saying, you know, saying to Darwin, oh, you haven't got a complete story of, ha of how the eye evolves. So, you know, this is natural selection stuff is a waste of time. But I think, you know, just as natural selection was a, was a great idea for a research program, a great general framework of how we can explain the, the emergence of life. So I think this Russell Eddington idea is, is similarly a, a great idea, a great framework for understanding um, how consciousness uh, fits into the physical world. So, so, so I still stand by this criticism, you know, that, that, that it's not a complete theory. And that's why it took me a long time to think, to, to get over these problems. But then I just kind of realized, well, look, all theories of consciousness have very deep problems. But I think the problems, once you get over the kind of cultural associations, I think the problems facing the panpsychist look to my mind much more tractable than the problems facing the, the other options. This might be a, a bit of a side question, but, it, but that whole notion of consciousness existing in the soul, part of me wonders if some of the resistance is maybe motivated by a kind of resistance to spirituality. Yeah, I suppose there are cultural associations with with um, dualism and certain religious beliefs, and certainly many of the probably most of of the world's religions involve some some kind of dualistic belief. In fact, most of mankind throughout history has probably involved some kind of dualistic belief. Actually, though, there are some um, contemporary philosophical dualists like David Chalmers and. Uh, Martina Nida Rumelin, who are complete atheists. In fact, Martin, Martina Nida Rumelin is, is a passionate atheist and she believes in, in the soul. She believes the mind is immaterial, but she thinks it's, it's just a, a part of the natural world. Um, nothing spiritual or religious. It's just something that ari that's not physical, but that arises from the, from the natural world and um, is, is governed by natural laws just as all natural things are. So I think... In principle, dualism can be divorced from any kind of uh, spiritual or religious point of view. 
But I, th I, I still think there are deep problems with it, deep problems to do with how on earth we make sense of, um, of the connection between an immaterial soul and, and, and the physical body and brain. That, that's the challenge, I think, really, for the, for the dualist. Take me to that moment of conversion. What were you doing just before you realized that, mm. no, I'm moving from, from a critic to defender? <laughs> As I say, my, my undergraduate dissertation, I, I concluded that the problem of consciousness was irresolvable and I just thought I've had enough philosophy and I went off to Poland actually and uh, learned some Polish and taught some English and, and just tried to forget about it really and read novels and popular science. And then, and then I came across this, this quite well-known article by Thomas Nagel called Panpsychism. Uh, from the 70s, which was never on my undergraduate syllabus. And it was, it, was a, it was a kind of revelation. It was just like, you know, initially thinking, nah, this doesn't, this sounds weird. But just thinking, well, hold on, this makes sense. And it, I think it did bring a, you know, a real sense of peace, in a way, sense of intellectual peace that I, you know, I, I had a picture of the world that I didn't have to deny anything I know from science and I, I didn't have to deny the evident reality of my consciousness. That was when I decided to return to philosophy, really, and uh, thought, well, there is an option here. There is a way forward. And I mean, this was when I was just 21, I think, um, after, after studying 21, 22. And so I decided to go back to do a graduate study at philosophy. And there, there aren't many, there weren't then many panpsychists in philosophy departments, but I, there was one at um, University of Reading at the time in England. So I went to study there with Professor Gaydon Strawson and... Um, and I think, you know, I, I didn't know it at the time, but it, that was 15 years ago. And, and in that time, I think uh, Strawson's writings and later some of my own have, have really, and, and a lot of other people as well, David Chalmers and many others, have really made this a, a, a serious position that people are investing a lot of time and effort into. So, so, yeah, that was really exciting and really exciting to find a way back into a subject I had previously loved, but I just uh, got a bit frustrated with. So Galileo kickstarts the scientific revolution by declaring that mathematics was to be the language of science. There's a very famous poetic quote, philosophy, by which he meant natural philosophy or natural science, is written in this grand book, the universe. So he's thinking of the universe as a book, which stands continuously open to our gaze, but it cannot be understood unless one first learns to comprehend the language and read the letters in which it's composed. It is written in the language of mathematics and its characters are triangles, circles and other geometrical figures. Without which it's humanly impossible to understand a single word of it. Without these, one wanders in a dark labyrinth. What is often ignored, at least in popular discourse, is the philosophical theorising that lay behind Galileo's mathematising of nature. Right? It wasn't just a matter of saying, I know, let's do maths, let's do science with maths. right? There was a problem when Galileo wanted to do this. And the problem was that before Galileo, people quite naturally took, took it that the world is full of sensory qualities. Colours, sounds, smells, tastes. So people thought, you know, the spiciness of the paprika is really in the paprika or the, uh, the smell of the flowers is really in the flowers or in the air surrounding the flowers. And the colours are really on the surfaces of objects. But the problem is it's hard to see how you can capture these kind of qualities in the purely quantitative language of mathematics. Hard to see how you can capture in an equation what it's like to taste paprika or see red. So this was a stumbling block for Galileo. You know, if, how can he, if he wants mathematics to describe the physical world, what do we do about these qualities that we can't seem to capture in mathematical language? Is there a paradox here that because there was too much focus on consciousness in Galileo's time, that this focus in turn ruined the scientific pursuit of understanding consciousness in that there was this sort of need to set it aside? As far as I know, Galileo wasn't 
hung up with consciousness. He was happy with it being in the soul. He was happy to, to put it on one side. What he wanted was to study. He wanted a mathematical conception of of the physical world so he could start doing mathematical physics. That was that was his focus. So so he thought, well, let's just put consciousness on one side. That's that's in the soul. That's fine. So, so he only ever intended physical science to be a limited project, right? Capturing the mathematical features of reality. He never dreamt that it could, in that kind of language you could capture the qualities of consciousness. And that project has gone incredibly well. But it was never designed to to capture the, the, the subjective qualities of consciousness. So I think, you know, if Galileo were to time travel to the present day, and hear about this, you know, problem explaining consciousness in physical terms, I think he'd say, you know, of, of course, I designed physical science to deal with quantities, not qualities. Consciousness is, 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 is an essentially qualitative phenomenon. And you just can't capture it in those quantitative terms. That's not the point of physical science. And so we end up in this place, and I don't want to make it sound like I'm, I'm drawing straight lines here, but we've we've ended up in this place where there there's a legitimate side of a debate that says, well, consciousness is is just it's irrelevant. It's not only not something that we can study, but it's simply not something that is important, or even in some cases, it's not even a thing. It's not even something that exists. And so I wonder, yeah. how do you then reintroduce this idea that we need to have a more integrated approach um, when you make an argument that consciousness has to be bought, brought back as, or, or even brought initially in as a, as a sort of a place for scientific inquiry? Yeah, I mean, so I mean, that, that's that's quite a radical position. So, so there are some some philosophers, uh, Keith Frankish or um, Daniel Dennett, in some moods, who say, look, consciousness doesn't fit into physical science, so let's say it doesn't exist. You know, just like just like science has ruled out magic and witches, um, it's the same with consciousness. Um, that that. that 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 position to me is, is a little. I mean, it seems to me nothing is you know nothing is more evident than the reality of consciousness. Or I mean, another point to make is how do we do science without without consciousness? So the only the only the only reason we know the results of experiments is through our own conscious experience of of the results of experiments. So so it's almost sort of self defeating to say we have a sort of scientific proof that consciousness doesn't exist. But I mean, I think I, I suppose the more general position of materialists is that there's a dig, there's a deep problem here. We don't yet have the solution. But, you know, physical science has done well. Let's just keep plugging away with neuroscience and we one day get, get the answer. But I think I, I think that really doesn't doesn't reflect enough on, on the philosophical underpinnings of the problem of consciousness and 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 its origins in 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 the design and purpose of physical science. I, I think we're going through a period of history where we're so blown away by the success of physical science and the incredible technology it's produced that we that we feel inclined to say, ah, we found something that works, and we've inclined to you know put all our faith all our ontological faith in, in, in what physical science tells us. But I think, I think just one has to appreciate that, you know, physical science is wonderful, but its, its aim has always been to, uh, for a limited task, roughly producing mathematical models that predict the behavior of matter. You know, so, so we, can be, we can be cool with, you know, appreciating how wonderful physical science is, whilst also appreciating that its, its purpose is not to deal with consciousness. And we can tell another story about how consciousness fits into reality. So one very common response is to say, OK, look, there is a problem here, but neuroscience is going to solve it. And an, an argument that's very often made is this is something like the following? Well, if you you know you look to the track record of physical science in explaining more and more of our universe, this ought to give us great confidence that if we just continue with our standard methods of investigating the brain, eventually we'll crack the problem of consciousness. So um, I call this neurofundamentalism. 
because it's meant to be provocative, I guess. It's very often comes, not always, but very often comes along with a kind of scorning of, of any approach that sort of deviates from this very narrow approach. So I want to make a couple of responses to this. But one thing I want to say is I'm a huge fan of neuroscience. I want to emphasize that. And I think neuroscience is absolutely crucial to making progress on consciousness. The only argument I would want to make is that neuroscience alone, I don't believe, can solve the problem of consciousness. So a couple of responses to this neurofundamentalist position. Firstly, I think that, that it often depends on a kind of oversimplification of science, as though it's always just a matter of doing the experiments and getting the data. Whereas very often, you know, great moments of progress in science involve reimagining the world. So if you think of the, you know, the, the leap of the imagination of Newton hypothesizing that the same force that pulls apples to the ground is the same force that keeps the, the moon in orbit around the Earth. Or the, uh, the move in Minkowski's interpretation of special relativity from thinking of space and time as separate entities to thinking them as aspects of a single unified thing, space-time. Or the, you know, the radical proposal in general relativity that gravity somehow emerges from the curvature of space-time. I mean, these kind of great moments of scientific progress it, this involve this kind of radical rethinking, reconceptualization of our picture of the universe. Now, you might say, you know, these were ultimately tested with observation, experiment, and of course that's true. But still, my only point is, I think if you have too much of a focus on observation and experiment, you ignore the role that deep thought has always played in scientific progress. And I have a hunch, given the, the intractability of this problem, that it's going to be re, not only neuroscience, but reconceptualizing our, how we think about the brain and how we think about the mind and perhaps the relationship between them that is ultimately going to help us make progress on consciousness. But secondly, more fundamentally, I think the neurofundamentalists draw the wrong inference from the success of physical science. So they want to say, look, science has gone so well. This should give us confidence that one day it will solve the problem of consciousness. I should say physical science. I want to distinguish, you know, what the hell is science? Physical science. I want to say, though, actually, that physical science has done so well precisely because it was never designed to deal with consciousness. Neurofundamentalism. It's a, it's a very emotional word. And I, I feel like whenever I hear the term fundamentalism, I tend to associate it with mm -hmm. certain kinds of politics or religion uh -huh. uh, that's built around sort of these absolutist ideologies. So is the science-only approach to consciousness a kind of fundamentalist ideology? Well, I guess I guess the, the, it's it's meant to be a bit provocative that claim. Well, you know, I, I mean, I should say some of my very close friends are on what I would call neurofundamentalists. <laughs> so it's uh, you know, it's 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 not intended to be anything personal or, um, but yeah, I I think I would say it's it's a kind of over enthusiasm with uh, a certain kind of of science. Which is great. I mean, I, you know, I'm a huge fan of neuroscience, and we're not going to make progress on consciousness without neuroscience. You know, that's that's definite. But you know, I think the problem is what, what ultimately what neuroscience gives you are correlations between what's going on in the brain and feelings or experiences. So, you know, we can know, we can find out that when people are in certain kind of brain states, they say feel pain or feel hunger or whatever. But, you know, what we really want out of a theory of consciousness ultimately is to explain those correlations, right? And that's, and we're not going to, we're not going to get such an explanation just by collecting more data about correlations. We're only going to get it by building a theory. And so, you know, I think sometimes you know, in, in physics, it's, it's well understood that we, that we have experimental physicists and then we have um, theoretical physicists like Einstein and Peter Higgs, you know, and, and they have a role to play. Whereas I think in certain quarters of consciousness science, it's, it's almost like the, 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 the more theoretical approach is not taken as seriously. Whereas I think especially with, with, with such a tricky thing like consciousness, it's, we're really going to make progress by doing more science, but also by building theories. And so is there, in the work that you've done so far, do you see opportunities or even a desire for that kind of collaboration? 
Yeah, I think I, I think certainly is. I mean, the, the the one of the leading neuroscientific theories of consciousness, this integrated information theory of Giulio Tononi and also defended by Christoph Koch, is um, it, you know is is one of the most promising empirically supported theories of consciousness. But it it, all, it also happens to have panpsychist implications. It, it it entails that consciousness is is a, a little bit more widespread than we commonsensically take it to be. I've got every hope that there are challenges to panpsychism, but you know there, there really is a, some a next generation of you know of of brilliant philosophers and um, neuroscientists who, who who are really working hard on these issues. So uh, here's here's a prediction. I think you know in ten years' time, the idea that panpsychism can be dismissed as just crazy will just seem crazy. I think because you know it really is a promising mode of inquiry. I find it you know interesting if you when you look back at you know, early scientists, all of these folks seem to be polymaths, right? Like every physicist was a yeah. painter or a philosopher. And I, I wonder what the impact of that, that sort of loss of breadth has had on, on yeah. these types of implications. Like if everybody was still interested in other things other than just the thing they do, maybe we'd already have more collaboration built into the system. Absolutely. I think, yeah, everything, I mean, yeah, in the, in the 17th century, I'm jealous of the people in the 17th century, actually, you know, you, you could know everything, couldn't you? You could know the latest developments in mathematics and physics. Whereas, you know, our leading physicists don't really know the, the up to cutting edge philosophy and vice versa. And, uh, you know, a, a prominent neuroscientist, Neil Seth, uh, him and I had a bit of a Twitter row about panpsychism. <laughs> there, there was an article in Quartz magazine saying, you know, there's this new academic credibility of panpsychism and then he wrote an angry blog post about it and and then i and then i wrote an angry blog post back <laughs> and then but then we, then we had a bit of a twitter around and, and then we realized we were talking at cross purposes because he was really thinking about about the issues in, in in neuroscience he's working on and you know he didn't think that they were much to do with panpsychism where i was really thinking about the, the philosophical foundations of of consciousness science and and it really turned out that we you know we were just in our own little bubbles and and then we made friends which was a nice end <laughs> so but uh but yeah so it is it is a big problem and it, philosophers don't reach out enough you know i think so, so so there needs to be much more effort i think to build bridges Panpsychism is certainly resurgent. Um, I mean, there are more and more people talking about this. And you talked about how when you first started out, there were very few people talking about this as a as mm -hmm. a place of inquiry. Do you think it's time has come or do you think that this is just a, a sort of a blip in the conversation when when people are actively looking for something new to talk about? I think that the problem of the debate on consciousness is, is changing so rapidly. It's gone from something that was a complete taboo to a problem that's taken very seriously. Um, but even though the problem's taken very seriously, I don't think many people think that we need to change our scientific paradigm in order to deal with it. I mean, I, th I guess I suppose that, that, that there are, people think there are two, two approaches you can have on consciousness. Either you think it's something so magical and mysterious that science will never get a grip on it, or you think it's you know, we just need to keep doing neuroscience and then we'll, we'll one day solve the problem. Whereas I, I take a middle way. I think there's every hope that we can one day have a, a complete science of consciousness. But I think we need to re rethink what science is and we need to realize how the problem of science arises from our, from our very scientific paradigm. And I, I, think, I think really the next step is to, is to treat consciousness as a datum in its own right. I mean, uh, we know that consciousness is real. And so if we, if we want a complete science of reality, then I think we need to, to conduct our scientific theorizing with the explicit aim of accounting both for, for the, the data of physical science, the quantitative data of physical science, but also for the qualitative reality of consciousness. Um, and I don't think we've really ever done that as a scientific community, as a society. So I think in, in an important sense, we haven't really started trying to work out what reality is like. Um, you know, we know that consciousness is real. If, if we want a complete science of reality, then we need to bring it in.
listeners, you've been listening to Panpsychism and the Nature of Consciousness with Philip Goff, Professor of Philosophy at the University of Durham in the UK. His book, Galileo's Error, a manifesto for a new science of consciousness, will be published in August of 2019. For more about him, along with links to his writing and lectures, please visit our website at cbc.ca slash ideas. Well, there you can, of course, always download our podcast. This episode was produced by Nahid Mustafa. Liz Naj is the associate producer of Ideas. Technical production, Danielle Duval. The executive producer of Ideas is Greg Kelly. I'm Paul Kennedy.